Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Keith Best of Onto Innovation. We're going to talk today about yield tracking in RDL. Keith, we're starting to get to bigger and bigger packages. We've got all sorts of elements going into these packages. So yield becomes a very important thing because the cost is going up, right? Yes, that's exactly right. So what are you finding in terms of problems in RDL? The biggest problem is trying to track the yield through the entire process. We have a, a summation again of issues. So all these RDL layers, it could be 24, 12 on each side of the panel. When you get to certain points of defects in the packages, when do you say enough's enough and throw away the panel and start again? There's a tipping point where it doesn't make any sense to process the panel if you have above, say, 50% yield loss. But tracking that yield through the various levels of RDL is a challenge. And you're mentioning panels. Everybody keeps thinking about when we think about packaging, we're thinking about wafers, but really what's happening is these things are not big enough, right? That's right. I mean, if you think about a, a modern package going up to 120 millimeters on a side, you can't get more than, say, four on a 300 millimeter wafer. You've got to go to panels. It's the only way to make it cost effective. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Keith, what are we looking at? Yes, so as you can see on this image over here, I'm talking about advanced IC substrates, uh, yield tracking, and I show three different layers, layer one, layer two, layer three and the impact of having killer defects at the different layers. So, of course, layer one here, I show two killer defects in these packages, and then I get to layer two, the same defects are there, no more defects, so the yield maintains the same number, 83%, 83%. When we get to layer three, a new uh, package ends up being defective, giving me a 75% yield. But you can see the impact of uh, yield is dramatic because they're so enormous, these packages. The question is, how do you keep a track of all of these through the different layers? This is only three layers. There are 12 layers on each side of the substrate. By the time it's gone through the fab for about two or three weeks, trying to understand what's happened to every single panel in the fab, track it, figure out the yield. Is it worth pursuing? Is it worth scrapping? Where do you draw the line? What's the cost? Being able to keep a track of these things by having genealogy of the packages and the, and the panels themselves is gonna be critical. How big are these packages? Typically, uh, they're about 75 by 75 right now, but we see a big push towards a 120 by 120 in the future and maybe beyond. But Typically, that's where we see the, well, the end at the moment, but it always changes. And so yield on this becomes a very expensive proposition, right? Actually, that's the biggest issue right now with advanced IC substrates, the yield. Because although it's a die-last process, it takes a long time to get the package um, design and everything together and get the whole panel through the process, be ready for the uh, die connect. And uh, the problem at the moment is people are so desperate to get them out the door that they just keep turning the handle pushing these out, even though the yields aren't exactly 100%. And I think uh, that's an area that needs to be focused on. And when we think about yield, it's not just the RDL. So RDL is one part of the yield. Now we have potentially problems in other chips that are going in there, potentially chiplets, things like that, all the interconnects, right? Yeah, there's also this whole embedded die conversation. That'll have its own defects, which is even beyond the scope of this conversation. This is mostly about RDL defects, which are, of course, critical. But if you imagine having an embedded die in the core of the uh, glass core or the copper cloud laminate, that in itself could be a killer defect and destroy the whole package. And so now you have all this additive effect in terms of yield, right? Yes, and the thing is, how do you actually know until you finish the package on the substrate that it actually yields? You have to do an e-test. You can't do e-test every single layer. You've got to know exactly where your defects are. And so being able to actually characterize killer defects is going to be critical. What is a killer defect? When it comes to RDL, what actually kills it? Right, typically uh, it's gonna be a, a bridge as shown in this image over here, where the two metal lines are connected or an open. These are both killer defects and these are reasonably easy to pick up if you have a good inspection system. And in fact, what's important is to be able to have automatic defect classification. So you have an offline uh, trimetrology tool to do inspection. And this tool will actually help you uh, actually capture all the defects confirm they're, they're actually real killer defects, and then immediately say the yield is this on this panel. Be very confident that the yield is what you've described by the killer defect count. Then, of course, track those killer defects and all the new defects that go through all 24 layers and be able to report to the end user, hey, by the way, this panel's at 75% uh, yield. Uh, next layer, oh, it's only at 50% yield. What's your threshold? The, uh, the FAB uh, team should be able to set thresholds for where they feel comfortable processing panels. And when that threshold's uh, reached, then the, the system should flag and say, hey, I've got 50 panels over here that are failing. Take some action. 
How do you track these defects? How do you actually find them in the first place? Okay, so typically an inspection system will have a way to compare a reference image against the candidate image. And of course, the candidate image uh, will have a defect and the, uh, the reference image won't. You subtract the images from each other and you then can see the defect between the two. That's typically how it operates. So this is done layer by layer, right? Yes, that's correct. And so you now have more insertion points because the more layers you have, each one requires an insertion point. Well, that's right. And in fact, it makes it even more critical because as we mentioned before, we're talking about the hits of yield. So for instance, on an advanced IC substrate, you know, 510 by 515, typically at a 120 millimeter square package, it'd be 16 packages on the panel. So if one package fails, it's a 6.25% reduction in yield, which is huge. As you keep going further and further along, uh, the impact gets worse and worse. If you compare that to a fan-out panel-level packaging package, which was called a core fan-out in the old days, there'd be 2,300 packages on the panel because the packages are quite small. They're only about 5x5 five five or maybe 10x10. 10 10. And so if you would lose one package here, that you only lose 0.04% of the yield. So, of course, it's become so much more important to get yield. If you can't yield through 24 layers, then you're going to be have a, have a serious cost for issue. Where are these giant packages going? You think about a, an iPhone, for example, it's a very small package. Yes, actually. Uh, it's mostly going into these uh, uh, high-performance servers, for instance, uh, to drive the uh, learning of uh, ChatGPT and also this DALI 2 you've probably heard about, which is actually converting uh, conversation into art. It requires huge amounts of memory, huge amounts of chiplet integration, and without advanced IC substrates, it's not possible. Are they still pushing advanced nodes in addition to the uh, RDL layers? Um, yes, but they, the advanced nodes just end up in the chiplets effectively, right? So right. you just bring them together to finally come in together in the package. What happens with embedded dyes? You mentioned that before. Yes, yeah, so if you look at the size of the package, they're so enormous today. People are trying to make them smaller. But you'll, what you'll see in the images, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, high bandwidth memory, some CPU, GPU chips uh, in a uh, package, but on the periphery you'll see a lot of uh, passive devices. And the distance between the passive devices and the actual uh, GPU uh, chips is a problem. Plus the fact that the package is so much larger. So if we take those uh, passives and put them into the, the, the actual package itself, at the core, embedded die effectively, right? That makes the whole thing slightly smaller. So you get much more performance improvement because you have uh, less distance between the actual embedded uh, die slash passives to the actual uh, GPUs themselves. So that's actually an advantage in two respects. Whenever we deal with more compute power in a smaller area, we're always dealing with thermal issues, and that's become a problem ever since probably about 90 nanometers. What happens in, in all these uh, different layers of RDL? Okay, this is a die last process. So uh, the thermal processing here is pretty straightforward. You haven't got to worry too much about fabricating the substrate. I think the biggest issue is when you put the die on the top, those die and the HPMs there, they're going to get hot. And uh, there's a number of uh, different uh, concepts right now to cool them. I think the biggest issue is when they get to be a thousand watts, I think. And people talk about immersion, which is really <laughs> kind of wild. You imagine putting the whole thing in a bucket of water. That could be quite interesting. But uh, yeah, that's definitely a challenge. And I think um, that's beyond the scope of advanced RT substrates. It's the chips last. It's beyond that. So you're looking at it from the standpoint of when it comes out of the packaging house, does this thing work as opposed to how is it going to work over time? Yeah, that's correct. So when you finish this 24 layers of RDL and build up layers, it comes out, you must make sure that the, uh, the front side and the back side are actually um, connected correctly. And then you're going to uh, connect your chips on top. You want to make sure you have 100% yield of that package such that when you put your known good die on top of it, they're going to be functional. Because the last thing you want to do is put known good die in a bad package. Otherwise, it's just a waste of money. People have been looking at larger wafer size, larger uh, panels for a long time. Where are we now with panels? Okay, so to your wafer question, as you all know, uh, we went from you know 2 inch, 3 inch, 4 inch, 5 inch, 6 inch, 8 inch, 12 inch. And there was a push to get to 450 millimeter. But of course, um, I think the number of players in the uh, equipment space, especially SML, I decided, you know what, we're not going to go there. As a result, no one else could actually make any more progress because if you can't do lithography, nothing else really matters. So now we're moving into panels because actually panel infrastructure already exists. We talk about the TVs, flat panel displays, that's been around for many, many years. So that architecture or infrastructure 
allows us to easily move into that space. There are many lithography tools that do panels as well for doing a flat panel display. And I think they have a good opportunity to help this industry move forward in this space. But they're also used to dealing with pretty large sheets of glass that, and, and fairly thin glass, because if you hold it up, you'll probably break it. This is much thinner though, right? That's right. Um, now we're talking about 300 micron thick glass, people are pushing down to sub, sub 100 microns. That is really a delicate glass. But um, I think when you talk about the number of layers you're gonna put on top of it, you have to remember now you're doing a, a Z change as well as a, not just an XY change. So uh, we've seen um, substrates uh, go from say 200 microns up to three millimeters in thickness because there's just so many layers. But with glass, if you can start thin enough and you have a higher resolution performance, you'll need less layers. So as a result, the whole stack might be slightly thinner and give you an advantage there. At each level that you're inspecting here, each different layer, does that information now feed back into the manufacturing process saying, okay, hold the line here, we're starting to see a problem? Yes, in fact, this goes back to that whole uh, ADC or true ADC uh, conversation where if you have a good inspection tool and can actually identify the defects and you can actually then look at your database of tools where the panels went through, you can actually use a, a complicated software that we have, well, is available, should I say, to actually figure out where the actual root cause of the problem was, because you can track every single panel for every single tool and know where the adders came from. And that helps the uh, root cause analysis is, uh, be solved pretty quickly. What's considered acceptable yield here? Yes, uh, well, some of the large manufacturers, they're in a the sort of 90% yield, they're pretty happy about that. Uh, but these uh, substrates, the copper cloud laminate, are quite cheap. So I would say they're almost at a disposable level. It's not like silicon. So certain companies, I've seen them in the development phase in the sort of 25%, 30%, and they try to get to above 50. Uh, it's this challenge because as soon as the process changes, it all starts all over again. But the guys that are doing kind of um, high volume manufacturing in the 90% region. Keith Best, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.